morning, everyone. Welcome to you as we celebrate another of our Sundays at Pentecost. Like you, I was awakened at four this morning with all the thunder, and I think some people went back to sleep. <laughs> but it's good to have you here, and it's great to have the choir back. Thank you, choir, after your summer hiatus. It's nice to have you back with us. Just a couple of announcements. There is going to be a first communion training class this Tuesday night, and if you are uh, around 10 years old and you've not been trained for First Communion, you are welcome, and it's for students and parents. And this coming Tuesday, we're baking bread, and the bread we're going to use on First Communion is the bread they make, so that'll be kind of exciting. Uh, this morning at the middle hour, we're going to have a uh, continuation of the series that I'm doing on how to read the Bible. So I invite you to join us. Uh, we're going to have some fun today thinking about some very interesting uh, aspects of biblical interpretation. This coming Wednesday is our first fall potluck. They are, as you may recall, on the third Wednesdays of the month. And that will start this, uh, this Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. And I don't know if we have any college students among us who are visiting from the university, but if you happen to be here, you are invited, or if you know some, you might invite them to come and join us for the potluck and get a free meal with some friends from church. Of course, we have confirmation also starting this Wednesday night at 6.30. Are there any other announcements? Well, we do yes. have, oh yes, Mark. Thank you, Barbara. It's a short-term commitment. It's going to be a great event. There's going to be spectacular music, brass choir, bells, and all sorts of wonderful things. But we do need voices for the ecumenical choir. If, you, if you've been thinking you'd like to sing, but you don't have a lot of time to devote to it, this is a great opportunity. Any other announcements? Then let us turn things over to uh, Diane, who's going to do a temple talk. And after that, we're going to have installation of Sunday school teachers. This morning I am representing the Global and Local Outreach Committee and what we're talking about this morning is the Lutheran disaster response. We've all seen things on television and so forth, you know, give to this fund, give to that fund that will help with the hurricane response. Our committee recommends giving to the Lutheran disaster response. And the reason we recommend that is because 100% of your donations go to disaster response. ELCA has the infrastructure already in place so that monies do not go for making you know, commitments to other people, the monies don't go for you know, Xerox and other things because that is already taken care of by the ongoing uh, structure of the ELCA Lutheran disaster response. So 100% of your donations go to hurricane relief. A second area of concern is that many of the other uh, agencies that you see advertised on television, internet, and so forth, deal with the emergency response, and then they're out of there as soon as the emergency is over. ELCA, Lutheran Disaster Response, stays there for the long haul. They stay there for years because there's things that need to be taken care of. Homes need to be rebuilt. Uh, means of earning a living need to be reestablished. Also, they take care of <coughs> spiritual needs. When a person loses their job, they lose their home, they lose family members, there's other things besides the physical needs of job and home 
There's also spiritual needs, and Lutheran disaster response also deals with that. Now, hopefully some of you will want to give more than just the coins that come into the uh, Sparadigm campaign. Recommended that you write your check to Lu Trinity Lutheran Church, and then down in the memo area, write Lutheran disaster response. The checks will go to the office. Lori in the office will then cut one big check, and the, you will receive credit on your Trinity account, giving account that you get final copy at the uh, beginning of the year in time for taxes. Okay, fourth point, I know that there is a stewardship drive coming next month, and this might be sort of interfering in your mind with a stewardship drive. I'd like to read a quote. It's from C.S. Lewis, and it's one that I found in a devotional book this summer. I will read, quote, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. End of quote. My fifth point is the same that we usually end with the Sparadigm article in the tower, give generously. Thank you, Diane. And now, uh, if we have Sunday school teachers here this morning at the service, I'd like to ask you to come forward for a brief installation. All right. Most of them may be coming to the second service. <laughs> but we can install you and remember the others. <laughs> And remember the others were installing. A reading from Matthew. Then children were brought to Jesus that he might lay hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And so I'd like to ask you, and uh, just so that it feels more comfortable, maybe we could all respond together. Um, will you assume this ministry in the confidence that it comes from God? Uh, and if you uh, would like to answer, I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. Will you teach in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and the confessions of the Lutheran Church? I will and I ask God to help me. Will you be diligent in your study of the Scriptures and faithful in praying for your students? I will and I ask God to help me. Will you trust in God's care, seek to grow in love for those you serve, strive for excellence in your skills and adorn the gospel with a godly life? I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. I now declare that each of you are duly appointed to be religious educators and teachers in Trinity's Sunday School program. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. And we rise for our opening hymn.
The love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Merciful Judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace us hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. If I could invite any children here this morning to join me up in front. Good morning, everyone. How are you? So this morning, we're going to talk about this really important word, and you're going to hear about it in one of our Bible readings for today, and Pastor Clay is going to share more about it in his message. And that word is forgiveness. Does anyone know what the word forgiveness means? Do you know what it means to forgive someone? So if you, if you hurt someone else or if someone else hurts you, you say you're sorry and they say, it's okay, I understand, I forgive you, right? So I found this great book that I'm going to share with you today. It tells a little more about the word forgiveness and I think it might help us all better understand that word, okay? And it's a book called Horrible Bear, okay? And it's by Amy Dykeman. And I'm going to share it with you today. And it starts with a girl who's flying her kite and the kite... The wind takes the kite into a bear's cave, okay? And she looks inside, and this is what she sees. A girl peeked into bear's cave. She reached, but he rolled. Crunch went the kite. Horrible, bear, the girl shouted. The girl stomped down that mountain. Horrible, bear. She stomped through the meadow. Horrible, bear. She stomped all the way home. Horrible bear. Bear was indignant. I'm not horrible, he said. She barged in. She made a ruckus. She woke me up. How would she like it if Bear got an idea? It was a horrible bear idea. Bear practiced barging. He practiced making a ruckus. He practiced waking someone up. Horrible bear bat squeaked. Perfect, bear said. Bear stomped right out of his cave. The girl stomped into her room. But she was too upset to nap, so the girl tried drawing. Horrible bear. She tried reading. Horrible bear. She tried talking to the best listener she knew. That horrible bear, he broke my... Oops, suddenly her stuffy couldn't listen as well as before because his ear fell off. I didn't mean to, the girl cried. Oh. Meanwhile, bear stomped down the mountain. Ra, ra, ra. Bear stomped through the meadow. Ra, ra, ra. He stomped straight to the girl's front door, pulling the clothesline with him. Ra which opened. I'm sorry, the girl said, and all the horrible rent went right out of Bear. Bear padded, he wiped, he got another idea. It was a sweet Bear idea. He fixed her stuffy with the clothespin. Thank you, Bear, the girl whispered. 
She had a sweet bear idea, too. She gave him flowers. Bear and the girl skipped through the meadow. They bounced up the mountain. And together, they patched everything up, even the kite. Nothing was horrible at all for the moment. So raise your hand. Have you ever done anything wrong or made a mistake? Who has done something wrong or made a mistake, right? I do every day. We all do, right? So, and sometimes those mistakes that we make, like the bear, right, they hurt other people. The bear rolled over on the girl's kite, um, and he didn't mean to. And you're going to hear a story um, from the Bible today about a, a king and two servants. And the one servant doesn't realize, because he was forgiven, that he too should forgive others. So Jesus says that we should forgive someone seven times, 70 times. That's a lot of times, right? And when we forgive others, it's hard to explain, but that forgiveness helps us feel better, right? We're not angry anymore like that girl at first was. Um, it's something that we should do, and it's something that God wants us to do, okay? Just like Jesus loves and forgives each one of us, when we try not to, we all make mistakes, right? And we all do horrible things sometimes. But that everyone, including us, deserves the love and forgiveness of others. So try to remember that this week, okay? Let's pray. Awesome God, we thank you for knowing that we all make mistakes and loving us anyway. Help us to forgive others who do wrong to us and to show your love to them. Amen. Thank you very much for coming up. Have a great week. Good morning. This week's reading is like an epilogue to the story of Joseph. It is many years after Joseph's brothers told him into slavery, and Joseph is now a powerful man and has the ability to seek revenge on his brothers. But this is a story of true forgiveness. The reading is from Genesis 50th chapter, verses 15 through 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Here is the reading.
gospel for today is taken from the 18th chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle all accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and his children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then this Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your sister or brother from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, by now you've gotten the idea that our <coughs> lessons are all about forgiveness today, so let's jump right in. I'd like to tell you three things about the subject of forgiveness today. Three things that we'll talk about. The first one is that forgiveness is hard. Now, maybe that's not news to you. Forgiving sometimes is very hard. I love this little story with Jesus or with Peter coming to Jesus. You can almost feel the pride in Peter's voice when he comes to him and says, How many times shall I forgive? As many as seven times? Peter knows seven is a holy number. Seven is a number that Jesus likes. Seven is a godly number. Now, the, the law would say, Well, you should forgive someone once. And if they sin against you, well, then be on your guard and pretty soon you don't forgive them anymore. That's the way the law was written. But Peter thinks he's really catching on to the way Jesus thinks. And so he comes up and he says, should I forgive someone seven times? It's like he really has it figured out. And what does Jesus say? No, Peter, not, not seven times. And then the Greek is funny here. It says 77 in our text. Sometimes you can translate those numbers as seven times 70. 490. In other words, what Jesus is saying, no, you don't forgive someone seven times. He says, you forgive someone an uncountable amount of times. When I was a little kid, I was maybe eight or nine years old, helping out with my dad on the farm. I remember one night in the barn, I'd been learning to count in school, like the kids all learn at about that time. And I had practiced counting, and I'd gone up to maybe a hundred or so. Wow! counted all the way to 100. That was magnificent. But I remember one night in the barn, I thought, I wonder if anyone has ever counted all the way to 1,000. And I thought I would try it. So as I was sweeping up on the aisles of the barn and feeding the cows, I started counting. One, two, three, four, and I was sweeping and doing the hay, and I got a little further. 147, 148, 149. I kept haying, feeding hay and sweeping. And that later on, 468, 469, 470, on and on I went for about an hour until by the end of the chores, I had counted all the way to 1,000. I was so proud of myself as a, as a nine-year-old kid. Can you imagine counting 470 of someone's sins against you? That's the whole point. Jesus is saying, you don't forgive up until a certain number, you give beyond what you could even count. And the point is, if you're counting at all, 
If you're counting to keep track, you're already on the wrong track. So then he tells this story about the, the 10,000 talents and the 100 denarii. Here again, Jesus is using one of these great exaggerations. I always got a kick as a teacher of preaching that the student preachers would come in and they'd work on this text and they'd figure out, well, let's see, a talent is worth so much and you multiply that times 10,000. They try to figure out how many years wages that would be. Well, if you're counting at all, you're on the wrong track. Jesus is picking the biggest number he can think. And he throws that out there as an astronomical number and then a small number in comparison. Because counting is not the point. One time a, a woman came to me in my office and said, Pastor, I've got a problem. My, my, my daughters and I don't get along very well. Should I keep on loving my daughter? Should I keep on forgiving her? And I said, well, I think there's only one answer to that question. The answer has to be yes. Love is always a risk. And sometimes when you say, I love you, the person doesn't say, I love you back. And sometimes when the person says, I forgive you, the other person doesn't say, I forgive you back. Sometimes your love is not returned, but still, as loving people, we have no choice but to continue to love, to be open even to be hurting, to be hurt again by that person. Now, I want to be clear, I don't mean to be abused. Abuse always needs to be stopped. But in terms of the hurt that we do to one another in our relationships, we should forgive again and again without number. The problem is forgiveness is hard, and sometimes we can't do it. The second thing I want to mention about forgiveness is that forgiveness is freedom. And I mean that in two ways. First, it's free for us. We deserve nothing. We deserve none of the grace that God gives us. We do not deserve to be forgiven, and yet God freely forgives us, and then God expects us freely to forgive others. Now, people will say, well, doesn't somebody need to ask for forgiveness before we forgive them? Isn't that the way it works? Well, that's not the way it works in the Bible. Look at Jesus on the cross. He's, he's nailed on the cross, and the very ones that put him there, he says of them, Father, forgive them. They, they don't even know what they're doing. And while they're casting lots for his garments, he's forgiving them. They show no repentance. And that thief on the cross next to him, he showed no repentance, but he did show kindness. And what did Jesus say? Surely today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus doesn't wait for someone to ask for forgiveness. And that's a good sign and model for us. Does someone have to ask us for forgiveness before we do it? No. No, we can forgive freely. Forgiveness is not in their hands, it's in our hands. And so we give it freely whether or not they deserve it. Forgiveness is free. But it's also freeing. Forgiveness is freeing because to carry a judge only burdens your heart and not the person who caused the wrong. To nurse an old injury is to keep an open wound. It's like pulling off a scab to let the heart wound fester endlessly. That's what happens when you fail to forgive. It happened, it, 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 uh, it's a problem for you, not for the other person. And it keeps you in bondage to the injury. It keeps you ensnared to its pain and its power. It gnaws on you for as long as you will let it. That's what not forgiving does to us. But to forgive is to let it go and to let the wound go and to be healed. Someone's, someone once put it this way, to forgive is to set a prisoner free. And you realize in the process that that prisoner was you. So forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is free. It's free for all who receive it and it's freedom to all who give it. Imagine a parent saying to a little child, I'm sorry for being so grumpy today. And the little child says, that's okay, mommy. I forgive you. Can you think of any more beautiful, freeing, life-giving words? Forgiveness sets you free. And then the third point, forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is freedom. But the third point is this, and this is in many ways the most important point, because it is hard. Forgiveness is God's business. Forgiveness is God's business. I know we're supposed to forgive, and we do our best, and we try that. But sometimes it's so hard, 
We just don't have the strength to do it. And that's okay, because forgiveness is God's business more than it is your own. And if you cannot forgive someone, then you simply need to let Christ do that for you. Now that sounds a little complicated, doesn't it? If you can't forgive someone, then you net need to let Christ do that for you. How does that work? I can't think of a better way to describe it than to tell you this true story. There was a woman named Cory Ten Boom. Is that a familiar name to any of you? She became a very important Christian speaker and evangelist. She had gone through World War II and found herself in Ravensbrück concentration camp because she and her sister Betsy had tried to save Jews when they were fleeing from the Nazis and they got caught for doing this. They were sent away to the concentration camp along with all of the Jews that were there. They were tortured and beaten like everyone else. Well, her sister Betsy died in the concentration camp and Corey made it through. A few years later, she was preaching at a church in Germany. She was talking about God's forgiveness and as she finished up, there was a man that came up to him. He was wearing a gray trench coat and he had a, a, a brown cap that he was wringing in his hands. He was a little bit nervous. She looked up at his face and it looked like a familiar bald-headed face. And then it struck her. She knew this man. And immediately, she replaced what he was wearing in her mind with the blue uniform and the cap with the Nazi skull and crossbones. And, then, and she knew immediately who this was. This was one of the Ravensbrück guards. He stands before her and he says, Fraulein, that was a great message today you gave about forgiveness. I love what you said about how God casts all of our sins to the bottom of the sea. It's so freeing and refreshing. He said, I know you rem remember me. I was at Ravensbrook, and I was one of the people that did so much harm. God has forgiven me for that. I know that and I trust that. But because of what you said today in your talk, I would like to hear those words from you. Fraulein, he said, will you forgive me? She looked at him. Her heart became cold. All she could do was remember what happened to her sister Betsy and all of those people that he had brutalized. And she thought to herself, is it really, really that simple? Everything goes away. Everything is forgiven. Everything is forgotten simply because he stands before me and asks for my forgiveness. Is it really that simple? She said, I stood there wrestling with the hardest most difficult thing I had ever known, ever done. And then she remembered that there's God's message about forgiveness, but there's this condition that we forgive those that have injured us. She said, she said she stood there with coldness clutching her heart. And then she realized something important, that forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart, she said. She closed her eyes and prayed, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. But you have to supply the feeling. The man's hand was waiting for her. These seconds are going by while he's asking for her forgiveness. Finally, she wills herself to raise her hand and touch his hand. And then she says, as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder. It raced down my arm. It sprang, in, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I, for, I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long time, she said, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did that. So, forgiveness is God's business, even more than ours. His forgiveness of our sins is a gift to us, and our forgiveness of others is also a gift. We cannot do it ourselves, but Christ can do it within us. So, let me ask in conclusion, is there someone in your life that needs forgiveness? Is there someone at school, perhaps, a bully, or a friend who has let you down, or a teacher who has hurt your feelings? Is there someone at work that troubles you, that took credit for one of your ideas, that got the promotion you thought was yours? Is there someone who stole from you, someone who told lies about you, someone who ruined your reputation? Is there someone who blamed you for something that you did not do? Is there someone who makes your life miserable, who puts you down in order to make themselves feel better? Is there anyone in life, in your life, 
that is hard to forgive. We need to admit it. Forgiveness is hard. But forgiveness will set you free if you can do it. The good news, my friends, is that if you cannot do it on your own, Christ will do it with you and for you and give you the freedom that always comes with forgiveness. Let us pray. Gracious, loving, and merciful God, you forgive us all our sins 10,000 times and more. Thank you for that gift. You have set us free from our sins. Help us to set others free so that we can be free ourselves. And above all, we pray that you send us your Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of Christ, to help us do what is so difficult for us, to do what we cannot, to forgive those who sin against us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we pray for the Church, the world, and all of God's creation. Good and gracious God, we pray for the church. Bless the ministries of congregations in our community, especially Redeemer Lutheran and Episcopal Church of the Intercession as they start a new combined congregation. Unite us in the proclamation of your life-giving gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Creator God, you spoke light into being. You separated the waters. You formed the dry land. Protect and enliven the creation you so love and make us willing partners in its care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the nations, you love all the peoples, regardless of where they are from. We pray for all who govern your people. Give them wise and generous hearts for those they serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine healer, Calm the anxiety of those who are wrongly accused, who suffer under crushing debt, or who are in prison. Reassure those who are lonely, impatient, brokenhearted, homebound, hospitalized, or ill, especially Duane, Ivan, Harley, Morgan, Faye, Francis, Donna, Jim, and Nate. We pray for Bob. Clarice, Dan, Larry, Carl, Mary, Bill, Nancy, and Ed. Bring comfort to Luann, Lula, Kevin, Judy, and family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for those people that are affected by the hurricanes and earthquakes and terrorists in London in the last several days. Assure them that you are there for them in this time of trial. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also for those who have made their special concerns known to us. The Reverend Scott Crandall's recovery from surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this assembly, for our guests and visitors, for newcomers to this community, for those who are certain and those who doubt, and for all who seek you in this place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We remember and give thanks for the faithful of every age who did not live to themselves, but lived to you, especially Hildegard, Abbess of Bingen. Raise us with them on the last day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment to greet your neighbor with the peace of Christ. Peace be with you, Ben.
Let us pray. Merciful God, everything in heaven and earth belongs to you. We joyfully release what you have entrusted to us. May these gifts be signs of your whole lives returned to you, dedicated to the healing and unity of all creation. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. You reveal your glory as the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored in your eternal kingdom. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. most merciful, O God, our rock and salvation. Hear us as we praise you. Call us to your table and grant us your life. When the earth was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a child. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom through Moses and the dance of Miriam. Ruth faced starvation, David fought Goliath, and the psalmists cried out for healing. And full of compassion, you granted the people your life. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept over the city. With infinite love, he granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for all to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. The Christ who died for us, the Christ who resurrect, was resurrected for us, the Christ who, whose presence is with us in every time and place has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.
sacrament. Bring them comfort and peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's love to the world in worship, witness, and service.